All right, Boston Spa, welcome to day two of Simple Harmonic Motion. You may have been thinking after day one, what the heck just happened? Is this a math class or a physics class? Well, as you know, it's, it's both. It's a science class and it's a math class, and this one tends to be a little more toward the math end. This unit tends to be more toward the math end than the uh, science end. Um, so what did we do last time? Let's take a quick look at, at what you should have learned from the last Simple Harmonic Motion video, video number one. Uh, first, uh, basically envision a mass oscillating on a spring vertically. Uh, there's a picture of that in your notes from the first day. And the furthest that the mass can be away from its equilibrium position, we're either going to call x0 or the amplitude, which is probably the a is what you're most used to in the wave unit, and x0 is what we'll typically call it here in simple harmonic motion. And we reviewed frequency and period, and we also brought back the notion of angular frequency, which is omega, not w, which is 2 pi times the regular frequency. And then we had uh, models for position or displacement, like where is the object some given time into its life? Because really what we're trying to do here, believe it or not, is we're trying to model a mass bouncing on the spring and being able to predict where is it at any time t during its entire life. And in order to do that, believe it or not, all you really need is the omega and the x0. Once you figure those out, you can put them in, that writes the equation of motion, and you're off. Um, and the, it also, um, the position function can be modeled with a cosine. It just depends, the difference between these two are the initial conditions. So wh where does it start? Does the mass start in the middle or does the mass start up at the top? That's really the only difference between those two. You'll see that as we go through today. And of course, x0 is the same thing as the amplitude, so I don't really care which of these you use, but we're going to try to stick with the top ones up there. And then you should have watched the derivative video. If you didn't do that, immediately cease and desist and go back because you will feel lost and go back and watch the uh, derivative video where I explain the concept of a derivative and we discuss the derivatives of sine and cosine. But you should now roughly understand that if you take the sine of omega t, it becomes omega cosine omega t. You always take what's in front of the t and you pop it out front whenever you take a derivative, so we get a free omega, and it switches from sine to cosine. <clears throat> and with the cosine function, cosine omega t, uh, again, the omega pops out, and the derivative of a cosine is negative sine omega t, so we end up with the negative sine there and the omega. But all of that's from last time. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, we're going to start this time with an example putting the use some of the things that we learned last time. Here we can see an object uh, where its displacement has been graphed as a function of time. And here's a reminder. Again, you probably thought you'd never hear this in physics class, but we need your calculator to be in radian mode for this unit. So please hit the mode button and select radian mode for this example. Again, during the example, if, when you want to do your own work and take notes, just hit pause and take the video at your own pace. Uh, let's see, part A says, what's the amplitude of the motion? Well, you can get that simply by looking at the graph. This thing is oscillating between positive 0 0.08 meters and negative 0 0.08 meters. So the amplitude, which we will either call A or X0, here we'll stick with X0, is 0 0.080 meters. Then the next question asks to find three things, the period, the frequency, and the angular frequency. <clears throat> well, one of those can be found uh, quite easily just by looking at the graph. Uh, we can see that one complete cycle, one sine wave, finishes in four seconds, and that is the uh, definition of a period, the time for one complete wave. Uh, so if we scroll down a little bit here, we can see that the period is four seconds. And of course, the frequency will be 1 over the period, so 1 over 4 is 0.25, and then here you'll see why in a second. I'm just going to keep it as 1 over 4, because it'll help us when we go to find the angular frequency. Actually, why don't you calculate the angular frequency now? All right, how do we do that? Well, the angular frequency, omega, is 2 pi times the regular frequency, so that's going to give us 2 and the regular frequency is 1 over 4. Now you can, now you can see 
why I left the 1 over 4 there. So the 2 over 4 gives you a 2 in the denominator, so we just simply end up with pi over 2 uh, radians per second. There's many more parts to this example. Let's see, at what time is the displacement, or times, is the displacement of the object at a maximum? Again, we want to be able to predict the displacements, the velocities, and the accelerations versus time. So we can simply get these by looking at the graph. When is it a maximum? Well, the displacement is a maximum at the crest and at the trough, which would be 1 and 3 seconds. So yes, 1 and 3 seconds. The next question asks, when is the velocity at a maximum? Why don't you think about that? Well, if we go back to the previous video, where we had the mass oscillating left and right, and we were discussing when is the velocity big, when is it small, when is it zero, and you should have taken away from that video that the velocity of the mass is the greatest when it's back to the equilibrium position. So we had a picture of a mass oscillating on a spring last time. And let's say it's oscillating between up here and down here. And this is the equilibrium position right in the middle. Well, the mass will be at rest at the top and bottom. And it will be going fastest as it crosses through the equilibrium position. So this is really asking part D, when is the object at its equilibrium position? Uh, and we can see that at 2 seconds and 4 seconds, and maybe even at the beginning, we're not sure how the whole thing started, but definitely 2 seconds, 4 seconds, and perhaps even the beginning. What is the acceleration at a maximum? Why don't you take a moment to think about that? Well, hopefully, um, our friend Newton is uh, speaking in your ear right now, saying that the acceleration is a maximum whenever the force is a maximum. And with springs, the force is a maximum whenever the stretch is a maximum. So what the question is really asking is, when is the stretch a maximum? So you might be thinking, well, isn't the answer to E just the same thing as it is to part C? And I would agree with that. <clears throat> one second and three seconds. The stretch is a max at one and three, therefore leading to the greatest accelerations. Now, we want to write the position function, the displacement function, um, in part F for this oscillating object. Now, remember, <clears throat> I told you that you only need to know the omega and the amplitude in order to write the displacement function. And remember, our omega is pi over 2. So the general equation for the oscillating mass when it's a sine function is x equals x0 sine omega t. And we need to put in pi over 2 for the omega. And we need to put in uh, the amplitude for x0. So <clears throat> your function should look like x equals 0 0.080 meters sine pi over 2 t. And that, believe it or not, has the power to tell you where is this oscillating mass at every time t uh, throughout its life. All right, now we're going to attempt to use the function. So we're going to take that function, go to the next slide. And we want to use the function that we just came up with. Use the function to, to figure out where is the object at each of the two times listed below. Well, the first time is t equals one second. So what we want to do is we want to plug into the equation we just found on the previous page. We want to put in a time of one second. Now remember, you need, that was an arrow, one second. <clears throat> remember that you need to be in radian mode to pull this off. So you're going to run through your calculator, 0 0.080 times the sine of pi over 2. For the pi, you can just hit, if you want, you can put in 3.14. Or over on the right side of your calculator where the up arrow is, you can do second function up arrow, and that will put the pi in for you. Uh, times 2, or sorry, divided by 2. And then you also want to multiply by the time, which is one second. So you're doing 0 0.080 sine 3.14 times the time of one second divided by two, close your parentheses, hit enter, 
And But we should also be able to do it by looking at the graph. At one second, we know it's at its peak right here. So we're hoping this equation, if we're going to have confidence in it, uh, gives us an answer of 0 0.080. And it definitely does. Hopefully you're getting that on your calculator. Now, a slightly more interesting example would be at 2.5 seconds. Because at 2.5 seconds, right in the middle here, if we trace down, um, it's not as easy to read as this uh, as example one was. Example two looks like if this is negative 0 0.080, it's looking like it's down at around negative 0 0.05 or negative 0 0.06. So let's hope that that's what we get as an answer. It's definitely got to be negative. We're down here in negative territory. So let's plug in 2.5 seconds. So we're going to have 0 0.080 times the sine of pi over 2, t. That's our equation. Then if we sub with units, 0 0.080 sine pi over 2. And then you have to multiply by 2.5 seconds. All that has to be inside of a bracket here, right? So when you do the sine function, you're doing pi times 2.5 divided by 2, and then you're closing the parentheses. And if your calculator's in the right mode and you type it in right, you should be getting negative 0.057 meters, which is exactly, well, well we, no, exactly. We said it would be between uh, negative 0.05 and negative 0.06. But notice this equation, pretty powerful. It allows us to predict exactly where the mass is going to be at every time t during its entire life. All right, on the next slide, here's where the notion of derivatives kicks in. Um, we want to take the function that we just worked with, the sine function, and hopefully we're pretty comfortable right now with uh, the position function, the one that we just used, where you just need to know the x0, the amplitude, and the omega. Once you know those two, you can write the function. So if you're starting with a sine function, this is what you're going to use for your main equation. And omega is 2 pi times the frequency. So this view of the equation just is inserting 2 pi f for omega. It's the same thing. And the maximum, if you think about how the sine function works, the sine function is going to oscillate between 0 and 1. So when you're graphing, even when this is 1, the biggest your answer can ever be is whatever this value is right here, right? Because when this becomes a 1, if this is 6, then, then your answer, the biggest it could ever be is 6. So this amplitude right here is our x0. So the maximum displacement is going to be whatever is out in front of the sine argument. So in this case, it's x0. So hopefully at this point you're familiar with that equation and the notion that x0 is the maximum displacement. All right. Here's the part that you might not be as familiar with or as comfortable with. How do we get the velocity function? Well, we need to take the derivative of this equation right here. So why don't you take a moment to calculate the derivative of x equals x0 sine omega t. Well, as you should have learned in the derivative video, and even on the introductory slide of this one, um, the sine of omega t is omega cosine omega t. So when you take the derivative, you'll get the omega popping out in front, the x0 stays there, and then the sine turns into a cosine. So there is our velocity function. So we can predict where it is every moment of its life with the first equation, and we can predict how fast it's going every moment of its life with the second equation. Now, what is this v0? Well, much like x0 represented the maximum position, the v0 is going to represent the maximum velocity. <clears throat> So clearly, whatever is out in front here must be the maximum velocity. So one of our other equations for this unit is v0 is omega x0. Hopefully that makes sense. We'll use it quite a bit. We'll use it in the next example. All right, what's the acceleration function? Why don't you take a moment to take the derivative of v equals omega x0 cosine omega t, and that will get us the acceleration function. All right, well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Let's reveal the answer here. We had the cosine function for the velocity uh, function, so when you take the derivative of it, 
you get the omega pops out in front again, and there was already an omega out there, so now it's omega squared. And we have a negative sign showing up here because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we end up with negative omega squared x0 sine omega t. And we have an a0 showing up. That must be our maximum acceleration. So the maximum acceleration in simple harmonic motion is going to be negative omega squared x0. So my hope is at this point that if I gave you the um, a picture of a graph or even gave you the initial position function that you could write the velocity function and the acceleration function and then be able to plug in the omega and the t and predict during any point in its life, where is it, how fast is it going, and what's its acceleration. That's pretty much the, the crux of the uh, mathematical part of this unit. Uh, the only wrinkle can be if you start with the, remember there's two different initial conditions. There's one where you start with the sine function and one where you start with the cosine function. So what would the equations of motion be if we started with the cosine function? Well, uh, hopefully it makes sense to you that this one should be x equals x0 cosine omega t, right? There it is. There's your position function. That's your uh, amplitude, and there's our 2 pi frequency. There's our omega. Now, what happens when you take the derivative of it? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so, and the omega pops out front, so you'll end up with the negative x0 sine omega t. Notice the negative sine comes in a little bit earlier when you start with cosine than when you start with sine, because when you start with the sine, you don't end up taking the derivative of cosine till you get to the acceleration function. Now we need to take the derivative of this guy, of the velocity function, in order to get the acceleration function. So the derivative of sine omega t is omega cosine omega t. So one more omega pops out front here. So we end up getting, again, that the maximum acceleration is negative omega squared x0, and then the function has the cosine omega t in it. So you should be able to come up with and use the three functions if you start with a sine, which we did previously, and the three different functions if you start with cosine. Now, the only difference is where it starts, right? If the object starts at its, at its maximum position, then you begin with the cosine function. If it starts at the equilibrium position, then you, then you start with the sine function. <clears throat> this graph down here in the corner is a pretty important one. This is an overlay of the displacement function, the velocity function, and the acceleration function. Now, clearly, we're starting with the cosine function here because we're starting up at 1 and we're letting it oscillate through time. Here it shows uh, you know, two complete oscillations of the mass. It is important to be able to sketch by thinking about it. It's, it's not like you're instantly going to do it. you got to think it through. And if you go back to that example on the third page of your note packet where the mass oscillated left and right and we were predicting is it positive, negative, or zero, at that point we talk through what is the velocity doing, what's the acceleration doing, so it should make sense to you. Let's go to the velocity function next. The mass is not moving when it's at its two extremes. So when you look at the velocity function, which is the long dotted one, when the velocity, sorry, when the displacement is at a max, it's not moving. The velocity is zero. And then here, when the displacement is at its max in the other direction, the velocity function is also at zero. So that should make sense if you follow it all the way around. Um, and the acceleration function should make sense because the acceleration is the greatest when the force is the greatest, which is acceleration the greatest when the stretch is the greatest. So here we have big stretch, and here we have big acceleration. Now, why are they pointing in opposite directions? Because the restoring force in simple harmonic motion is always in the opposite direction that the force is pointing, and the force is always trying to bring you back to the equilibrium position. So when you're displaced in the positive direction, the force and hence the acceleration will be in the negative direction. So if you think through all the places where the acceleration is zero, the acceleration is zero right here, exactly when the force is zero, which is when the stretch is zero. So these three graphs, again, they take some thought, but you should be able to think about how they would compare to each other and how they would overlay on each other. 
I'm not terribly concerned about the amplitudes, like how do I know which one's taller? Well, you really don't. What I care about is uh, in the X direction, uh, where do things uh, correspond to each other? All right, the next page of the note packet has an example on it. And when we finish that one, we'll call it a day here in the second simple harmonic motion video. Um, this example is a multi-part example. And we have an oscill a period and a half, uh, kind of. Notice it goes off the graph here. There's roughly one and a half waves here. We need to uh, figure out angular frequency and hopefully write the positions and predict with the, uh, the, with the functions. So first, the angular frequency, how do we get it? Well, we should probably begin by finding the period, right? The period is the time for one complete wave. And if you look closely, at, I, I want to say 2.4, but it looks like it's finishing a little bit between before 2.4 seconds. So I'm going to say uh, 2.39 seconds. And if you said 2.4, no worries, because it looks like it's very close to 2.4. All right, how does that help us? Well... Omega, which is what we're looking for here, is 2 pi f. And since f is 1 over the period, uh, to find our angular frequency, we can do 2 pi, 2 pi over capital T, the period. And if we put in 2 pi over our 3.9 seconds, we should end up with an omega of 2.63 radians per second. I like the radians per second, but as you know, radians are invisible, so 2.63 1 over seconds is probably just fine. All right, next question. What is its maximum velocity? Well, in this video, we came up with our two equations, one for max velocity and one for max acceleration. If you look back, you will see that our maximum velocity, the fastest it will ever go, is omega times x0. And we need to get x0 off of the graph. Well, it looks to me, it's definitely not 6.5. It's quite a bit below that. So I'll say 6.3 centimeters. So if we want to plug into this, uh, the omega is going to be the 2.63 radians per second, I'll just put R over S, radians per second, times an X0 of 6.3 centimeters, parent of 3. Uh, that will get us an angular velocity, if you multiply that out, of uh, roughly 16.6. Six. And notice the units, we have centimeters per second meters per second. Sorry about that sideways line there. I was running out of room. All right, what's its... Ma oh, and the time that it occurs. So when is it going the fastest? Well, it's going the fastest when it's going through the equilibrium position, right? That's when, that's when it's going the fastest. So it's going to be going the fastest here at zero. And that looks like 1.2 seconds, and then at our 2.39 that we said before. All right, maximum acceleration in the time that it occurs. Well, the maximum acceleration is the stuff out in front of the trig function on the acceleration function that we wrote, which if you take a look back will be negative omega squared x0. So if you plug everything in there, you're going to have the negative, and our omega is 2.63 radians per second, and we need to square that, right? Negative of omega squared, and then 6.3 centimeters. Notice the units work out nicely for us, centimeters per second per second. We should get roughly negative 43.6. 43.6. Radian, that's an R, radian per second per second. Sorry, centimeters per second per second. That's our maximum acceleration. What's the time that it occurs? Well, it should be all the swell. The maximum acceleration is going to occur when the maximum force occurs, which occurs when the maximum stretch occurs. 
So it's going to be whenever this function peaks, which on this graph um, is in three locations. This is roughly 0.6 seconds, 1.8 seconds, and looks like it's just shy of three. I'll say 2.98 or three seconds would be just fine. All right, what's the velocity? Now we're going to use our functions. We want to find the velocity at 1.3 seconds, so we need to uh, come up with the velocity function. So notice we started with the sine, and we have to take the derivative of that. So hopefully you would have come up with v equals omega x0 cosine omega t. Then we need to plug in. <clears throat> Why don't you take a moment to plug in your omega of 2.63 radians per second and your x0 of 6.3 centimeters, and your t of 1.3 seconds. When you do that, you should get a number roughly equal to negative 15.9 centimeters Per second. Does it make sense that it's negative? Well, at 1.3 seconds, 1.543, at 1.3 seconds, you're right here. So yeah, you've, you've come out of positive territory, you cross the equilibrium position, and you're heading in the negative direction. So your velocity, so not only would your position be zero, but your velocity would be zero. Is it possible for your position to be zero or negative? and to have your velocity positive, well, after you reach the negative maximum displacement, you're going to start heading back in the positive direction. So over here on this side where I'm drawing, you would have a negative position answer, but your velocity would end up positive on the velocity function. All right, last page. I've decided to skip this part, and I'm going to change this a little bit. Notice you probably had extra words out here in your note packet. I've decided to change a little bit. I just want to use the acceleration function to calculate the acceleration of the object at 1.1 seconds. Because in the previous example, at 1.3 seconds, we found its velocity. Now let's use the acceleration function. So what is the acceleration function? Well, we started with sine. And then the velocity function takes us to cosine. And then the acceleration function will take us back to sine. So we'll have negative omega squared x0 sine omega t. Why don't you go ahead and plug everything in and see what you get for an answer. Well, I get roughly negative 0.246 centimeters per second per second. I hope all that makes sense. If not, you can always back the video up and, and, and watch parts of it again if that particular area didn't make sense to you. But again, it all rests on the derivative video. So hopefully you gave that a good watch and that this simple harmonic motion stuff is starting to make sense.